Welcome to Population Ecology. This is the other relatively long lecture, shorter by about a third than the previous one. And then the next two are half this length or shorter. And let's just dive right in by defining a population. A population is all of the individuals of a single species in a given area. Once again, population is one of those nested terms. You could be talking about the population in the southeast corner of a forest. You could be talking about the population in the forest. You could be talking about the population in the state, the population in the mountain range, the population in the West. So it's a nested term, which is why we have given area, a nice general term. But still, when examining uh, ecology interactions, At the population level, we can see trends, essentially changes um, in populations in certain parts of their environment. So, for instance, we're going to be talking about um, population changes, uh, evolutionary changes. and the environments, rolling it at more than just broad levels. We're gonna have a couple of little rules to talk about. So the first up is Allen's rule. Allen's rule is related to population biology uh, and basically how populations interact with climate. So, one quick rule, Alan's rule is kind of all about endotherms. So, already we're sort of restricted to birds and mammals, shorthand. And it kind of has to do with extremities. So, endotherms in colder climates generally have shorter extremities, shorter or smaller extremities. Right? So if you have temperature you know what let's uh let's give me some space to actually do that because that's going to be easy let's just uh, uh burr, burr, oh. screen there boop boop all right here's temperature and here's ear size because that's an easy one and mere This will also work with leg length. Um, this will learn, uh, work with muzzles. Uh, this could work with noses, but ears are often like your go-to. Ears and legs. So this is Alan's rule in graphical form and it is for endotherms. Now the reason for Allen's rule and why it works so well 
is because extremities are great at heat exchange. Right? You can exchange a lot of heat between a body and the atmosphere at the extremities, at the ears, at the fingers, at the arms and legs and toes. The extremities can do a lot of temperature exchange, right? So when it's hotter, larger extremities allow you to moderate your heat. So large extremities lose heat. Let's just put that in quotes, lose heat. And small extremities keep heat, lose less heat. <laughs> So, in colder climates, smaller extremities mean there's less organs, uh, less surface area to lose heat at. So now what we're going to get into is the surface area to volume uh, ratio. So surface area to volume is uh, going to become important here especially as we get on, but essentially um, the more surface area you have, the more heat loss you have. Volume isn't as important in this equation just yet because, um, you know, A thin organ like an ear uh, is going to have a relatively small volume like like if it was I don't know my dog's ear is like three millimeters thick and hair is probably like four millimeters let's say 0 0.5 centimeters thick there And then, I don't know, hares have a big ear. Let's call it 24 centimeters and like another half. I'm going to have a really, I'm doing math again. I shouldn't be doing math. 6 to 1 surface area to volume. And then over here, if it's like a 10 centimeter, then it's going to be half and half, 2.5 to 1. Oh, the math does work. Okay. So, yeah, basically like this. Because we're talking about extremities, and extremities tend to have a smaller volume, right? They're thinner. Having large surface area on a thin structure, on a low volume structure, means you have a lot of area for heat loss. That's why ears are such effective heat loss structures, right? So if you have a smaller ear, a smaller extremity, then uh, your heat loss is going to be lower because there's just not as much area to lose heat. Here, I had a 24 centimeter, like a 10 inch long ear on this jackrabbit, right? And then ears are thin. So five milliliters or five millimeters deep and wide. Yeah. So that created my example six to one for every six units of surface area, there's one unit of volume. And over here on my Arctic hair, I have a small ear. So I made it less than five inches long. And then 
still kept the half millimeter thing and I get 2.5 to 1. For every 2.5 units of surface area, there's one unit of volume. In other words, there's just less surface area for heat loss to occur. More surface area for heat loss to occur means, amazingly enough, more heat loss occurs. Less surface area for heat loss to occur, amazingly enough, less heat loss. So, endotherms in colder climates have shorter and smaller extremities. Ears are your amazing example. Here's a Finnic fox, and here's an Arctic fox. And amazingly enough, the Phoenix fox lives in the desert and has big giant ears for maximizing heat loss. Also, they are very small and edible. So, uh, you know, if you can be taken out by a, uh, a tennis ball, you know, then uh, being able to hear things coming is equally helpful. The Arctic fox has much, much smaller ears, right? Uh, so that has minimizing heat loss effects. Not too terrible. Hey, let's look at arms and legs, or specifically like legs. So here's uh, an Inuit person. And this is a Maasai her uh, herdsman. Uh, the Maasai live in Kenya, Tanzania, and having extremely long extremities maximizes surface area for heat loss. Inuit people have shorter extremities to help maintain heat loss. Uh, so, short squat body, lose less heat. Long, uh, gracile body, lose more heat. Ta-da! All right. Then we have Bergman's rule. And Bergman's rule, again, surface area to volume. But now we're not talking extremities. We're talking about, like, the overall size of the animal. And an important thing to note is that a high surface area to volume ratio means high temperature loss. So here's a mule deer. Uh, and mule deer uh, are rather... Oh, wait, no. This is a whitetail in Canada. Canadian whitetail. The Canadian whitetail is, uh, it looks an awful lot like a mule deer when you get up north. Um, and the reason is that a larger animal has a lower surface area to volume ratio, right? So uh, if this deer is like, I don't know, uh, a half meter, 50 centimeters tall and like, uh, how about 150 centimeters long? And let's just do 50 centimeters wide. Then we can do our math because everybody loves math. This surface area is 35 uh, square centimeters and the volume is 
375 cubic centimeters or meters excuse me 35 over 375 means we have a surface area to volume ratio of 0 0.093 a key deer is a very small critter um, when you get out into the florida keys a white-tailed deer gets to near dwarf sized um, and the florida keys are also very hot so instead of being particularly long uh you're gonna run into the point where they're like i don't know like particularly small i think they get some about like that that's like a foot and a half yeah so let's call it 50 and 50 and like 25 who cares so 62.5 volume Twelve point five surface area. And we get a zero point two surface area to volume ratio. So we have more surface area per unit volume. And more surface area means more heat loss. So even though a key deer is smaller, it is also lower in volume. So a bigger body retains heat better. Get cats trying to chew a power cord. So uh, more mass equals bigger body. equals retains heat and it retains heat in part because large bodies have a lower surface area to volume ratio and a lower surface area to volume ratio means lower heat loss right so it's kind of interesting um, Bergman's rule for body mass uh, follows the same basic rule uh, greater surface area to volume means uh, greater heat loss lower surface area to volume means lower heat loss but because we're talking about the mass of the whole animal right rather than the mass of a really thin extremity, then larger means retaining more heat. So uh, it's all about the extremity versus the big old body. Uh, when you're talking about the core body, right? More mass means you retain heat easier. So I don't know, kind of cool. Uh, so that's Bergman's rule. Al Allen's rule is when we're talking about extremities in the cold, smaller extremities in the heat, larger extremities. When you're talking about the size of the whole animal in the cold, larger animal in the heat, smaller animal. For the same exact reason, managing heat loss through surface area to volume. A low surface area to volume 
This is like half the surface area to volume of our imaginary key deer. So there you go. You lose less heat the bigger you are. Um, and this isn't just necessarily the math. Uh, if you think about it, the larger the body mass, the deeper into the viscera you have to go to find like the heart. There's more muscle surrounding the body. There's more fat surrounding the body. So in addition to just the math on shapes and the available surface area for heat loss, we also have the you know biomechanical consequences of getting a larger body. But Bergman's rule is kind of just based on the mass. Uh, there are exceptions. Um, there's a few megafauna still left in the world. Uh, megafauna means big animal. And elephants, rhinos, hippos. These are some of the few megafauna left on land. And they violate Bergman's rule. They ignore Bergman's rule. Because as you know, elephants, rhinos, and hippos are very, very large. And they live in a very, very cold, or cold, a very, very hot environment. African savannas, uh, African deserts, uh, African tropical forests in the case of the forest elephant. So, um, the African megafauna just sort of breaks Bergman's rule. <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, one might be able to make an argument that their size is sort of an evolutionary leftover from the megafauna that evolved uh, when the oxygen was low and then they stayed large when the ice age set in. So you're getting into hypothetical territories there. Okay. Powerful regulators of populations include density, right? The density of a population, the greater the effect it has, right? Increasing density equals a greater effect. And increasing density has two huge effects uh, in the form of competition for resources and uh, mates. So let's just put resources and do food, uh, shelter, mates. Um, and then also disease. Uh, the greater the de dependency, the easier it is for diseases to spread between individuals, right? You're contagious for not necessarily, you might only be contagious for like a day, but if you're living around a hundred million other birds and you're contagious for a day, you're gonna give it to a crap load of other birds. Um, so, you know, if you're in Wyoming, then, you know, you're virtually immune to communicable diseases because there's nobody there. Okay, so these are actually two powerful regulators of populations, competition and disease. Uh, if you have a population that gets really dense, um, there's more competition for resources like food and shelter, which means there's more losers and there's more unhealthy animals uh, and those unhealthy animals are more susceptible to disease and then disease could wipe out a large number of them and then suddenly your density isn't so bad. 
So there's kind of a feedback effect. Uh, so um, we have a, a negative feedback effect. Sort of a cascade consequence of density getting too high. It almost self-regulates. Now, there are factors that do not change with density. So, for one, uh, sorry, let's just define density independent factors. In order to be considered density independent, it would be a factor, so it would be a factor that affects birth and or death rates. Mm, purple is not a good choice. It's a good thing I'm talking. Uh, so it's a factor that affects birth and or death rates and uh, density doesn't alter that factor's effect. Um, intensity of the factor. Red's the much better one. So basically a density independent factor in regulating population is a factor that affects birth and death rates because if you're regulating a population you're affecting birth and death rates and it is a factor that does not alter in intensity with uh, density so genetic drift from natural disasters that is density independent. The density of a population will not affect the chances of the volcano going off. Climate change, right? The amount of ground squirrels is not going to affect the global average temperature increasing. I mean, you could reach a hypothetical number of ground squirrels where the amount of CO2 they uh, exhale can affect it. But it's not a realistic number of ground squirrels. So, the density of ground squirrels is not going to alter climate change, but climate change sure as hell can alter the density of ground squirrels. The density of ground squirrels is not going to alter whether or not that volcano goes off, but if that volcano goes off, it sure as heck is going to change the density of ground squirrels and uh, human factors. The density of ground squirrels is not going to make us less likely to build a parking lot over all the ground squirrels. Man, always coming back to how humans suck. Okay. So when talking about patterns of density, patterns in population density, we can create some categories based on how they space themselves out. So dispersion is how a population is spaced out in their given area. Right? So, clumped dispersion is most common. For one. Clumped is basically where 
individuals come together around resources. Does that patch of grass have the most nutrient-rich flowers in it? You better believe all the deer who eat flowers are hanging around that clump of grass, right? So you can just imagine in each of these clumped spots is some kind of resource that they are capable of taking advantage of. So clumping around resources is obviously the most common type of spacing because you need access to them resources. All right. Uniform spacing is rarer. Um, in general, um, this could occur because of territoriality, territory defense. So, resource defense is what it comes down to. Which comes down to keep away. Right? So, these penguins here have a more uniform dispersion because each one has selected a nest site and then they're trying to keep the nearby males away from their nest site because it's their nest site and they want it. Um, could be you hang up a bunch of, you know, nectar hummingbird feeders evenly spaced out. And then rather than having 50 hummingbirds around each feeder, uh, you have like one pissed off hummingbird beating back all the other hummingbirds. And so each feeder ends up with defenders and then you evenly space out your hummingbirds because they're guarding their resources. So, resource guarding. Could be food. It's often food. Could be nesting sites. That's a resource. Could be females. Uh, so, lots of stuff. <coughs> That's uniform. Then random is unpredictable spacing. So... I think your easiest example of unpredictable spacing would be organisms like plants that are wind dispersed. So uh, plant seeds are often like uh, dandelion seeds undergo wind dispersion. So um, that is more likely to be randomly distributed. Um, uniform dispersion can also result. Uh, I was very, um, I was very animal oriented on clumped and uniform. I mean, honestly, plants clump around nutrient rich deposits in the soil and like little dappled areas like breaks in the trees where there's a clearing for sunlight. So you get cl plants clumped in clearing. So that's easy enough. Uh, and then as far as territoriality and plants, um, we talked about that when we talked about plants that seek, uh, secrete chemicals that interfere with the health and growth of nearby plants in order to minimize competition. That's allelopathy. So that can produce more uniform dispersion. All right, continuing on in population dynamics. Populations are not static. Populations experience changing demographics. So, uh, demography is essentially the study of dis uh, statistics that describe a population. 
the study of vital statistics. It could be as simple, uh, so vital statistics over time. So you can see the changing demographics. Um, vital statistics could be as simple as birth and death rates. And if they're suddenly changing, you might be able to link them to something else. Like maybe there's a particular phenotype that is easy to see by predators. And so that phenotype is going to start getting picked off, which means your death rate's going up for that phenotype. And then the overall phenotypic diversity in the population changes because a whole bunch of a particular phenotype got picked off. Other things that can alter, uh, alter the demographics of a population, immigration and immigration into exit. So... Uh, animals and their particular phenotypes coming into the population, animals and their particular phenotypes exiting the population. So demographics can change as animals with varying phenotypes are born or move in. And demographics can change as animals with certain varying t phenotypes uh, die or leave. So that's demography, population demography. Now this can lead to uh, interesting stuff. Um, Metapopulations get into a very fascinating uh, aspect of population demographics. So, metapopulations are all about immigration and immigration. <coughs> and they occur when you have regular immigration and immigration. So, a metapopulation is a network of distinct populations interacting with each other by exchanging individuals. Immigration, immigration. So, metapopulations are affected by the degree of interaction. Um, so, uh, the more immigration and immigration there is, the greater uh, effects you'll have on those metapopulations. Um, so, uh, how much they interact can dispend, depend on dispersal. Dispersal affects metapopulation interaction. Right? So, uh, one of the most common ones being resource clumping. Right, uh, so you have the clump of resource A, the clump of resource B, and the clump of resource C, and you know you'll have a bunch of individuals show up here at A, and then a bunch show up at B. And then a bunch show up at C. And then as C fills up, 
uh, and there gets to be more competition. Some of them bug off to B, and some of them bug off to A, right? And vice versa, and vice versa. A, B, and C will all migrate around. So, uh, <clears throat> dispersal heavily affects metapopulation interaction. Uh, clumping, so, um, and uh, how close clumps are to each other. And how rich the resources are. So that's not too bad. When describing metapopulations, we talk about the extinction uh, of a population. Now, this is not extinction of a population at the whole entire given area scale. Uh, what we're talking about is, <clears throat> here is, let's say we have that resource A, B, and C creating metapopulations A, B, and C. And then resource C gets exhausted. And suddenly all the individuals that were in resource C leave for other resources. And resource C is extinct. So metapopulation C went extinct because the resource ran out. That's a way to talk about it. You could also have a disease hit a, re a metapopulation. A predator hit a metapopulation. So um, metapopulations are governed by the rate of extinction. Uh, and the rate of colonization. Right, now that all the individuals from C showed up at A and B, well, A and B are crowded, so organisms from A, B, and C are going to go off to other empty sites and colonize a new site. Um, in general, because you have a bunch of empty sites and a bunch of occupied sites, the rate of extinction and the rate of colonization are balanced. So, <clears throat> not too bad. Metapopulations are maintained through a balance between the rate of extinction and the rate of colonization. The degree of interaction is governed by the dispersal of the organisms, clumping being the most common, right? Because uh, the rate of extinction and the rate of colonization are balanced, uh, the overall population is maintained. So even though the population at C went extinct, um, <clears throat> populate like site D will now get a new population and site E will now get a new population. So the overall population is maintained because we have a balance of metapopulation extinction and colonization. So, um, when looking at metapopulations, we can describe some of them as source and sink metapopulations.
a source meta population is basically where we have uh, a habitat that can provide long-term growth. Right, it's stable and it's probably resource rich. In other words, everyone does great at A because it's stable and it's resource rich, which means there's a lot of breeding at A, which means there's a lot of organisms leaving A as the competition gets too high and A is a source for new metapopulations. A sink metapopulation is kind of the opposite. Uh, basically, you have um, a habitat with few resources. So, uh, if a bunch of animals show up at B, which is looking pretty sad, let's see here. let's say just just a ton of them arrive at B right so here's all my bugs arriving at B and there's blue flowers here but they're not a lot of them right and so all my bugs arrive at B from my source population and they eat it down real fast and then they have to disperse to a new location or die. And they have to do it relatively fast because there's few resources. They use up all the resources relatively quickly. So the meta population of B appears relatively quickly with these blue flowers here, but then the blue flowers done got at up and all the organisms at B disperse to other metapopulations or die. So, um, the big example here is uh, the Glanville fritillary butterfly on this page. Uh, so, he's a very pretty butterfly. Um, and essentially, This butterfly uh, is found in Finland. Uh, so there's 500 meadows across the Åland Islands of Finland. And though in those 500 meadows, uh, biologists have characterized 4,000 suitable spots for this butterfly to live. Um, and so, they show up regularly uh, in these spots where they can live and they do well for a while and then the population goes extinct as it completely disperses or dies. Um, none of the populations can survive on their own completely. So in metapopulations, even a source is long term but not permanent it will go extinct without immigration it can kick off quite a few generations before going extinct but it's still not a long-term location. A metapopulation occurs where there is no one single perfect habitat spot where they can live forever and ever. Amen. Metapopulations are 
constantly on the move and constantly changing, right? So um, these butterflies flit around to different meadows to feed at different spots and satisfy their food requirements and mate and lay eggs and then flit around to other meadows. Um, all to try and keep up the resources they need to stay alive and breed, right? So in a meta population, no one population can survive on its own. Not even a source. Continual immigration with an I and immigration with an E keeps these populations going and continual colonizing new areas when old areas go extinct keeps these populations going. We effectively have a stable population, but when you get down to the individual meadow level, New populations are showing up in meadows and dying off or dispersing out of meadows constantly. There's no, this is the Glanville Fritillary Meadow. This is where they all live. They are moving around between 500 meadows and 4,000 suitable uh, spots where they can feed and breed. So, the key to a meta population is that it is a net population, right? The picture here is, uh, is Finland, the Åland Islands of Finland. So we can say there is a population of that butterfly on the Åland Islands of Finland. That's our given area. But when you look at the islands, there's no single site where all the fritillaries live all the time, and that's their location. That's where they live, and they're fine. They're fine. Everything's fine. No. Grand, uh, Glanville fritillaries are constantly moving between locations because no single meadow habitat can support the permanent population. The permanent population is only maintained by them continually moving between these little meadows all across the island and immigrating into each other and emigrating away from each other. So, uh, meta populations is one of those I kind of had trouble with. Hopefully that helped. I try and think of different ways to describe it. Okay, halfway done. Um, Population dynamics. Let's talk about how populations can expand and contract. Uh, basically, when we talk about changes in range, there's three main factors that cause a change in range. When we say a population range expands, amazingly enough, that population moves to take over new areas, and when they contract, the population reduces in size, right? So first off, environmental change, right? So glaciation would be like an awesome example of that. So you have this forest here, right? And that the glacier expands out and suddenly you've got half the forest. So that's a big giant environmental change that caused a contraction in range. And then the glacier recedes <coughs> and suddenly you have more space to expand. And so the big environmental change occurred, the receding glacier and the range expanded, right? Could also be temperature shifts. So um, you had, uh, <clears throat> in the present, these coniferous forests are restricted to two to three kilometers in elevation before you get to alpine tundra tree line. But 
in the glacial period 15,000 years ago. Uh, temperatures, uh, cold tolerant plants did much better. And so the range that these coniferous forests expand, uh, were in was expanded. So, not bad. Reason one of three, environmental change. You can think of a bunch of others besides glaciation. Reason two of three, population dispersal. So movement, oops, my. Movement away from their origin or high population densities. In other words, uh, colonizing new territory new habitats um, gives us the opportunity to find new resources and establish a healthy population, right? That's not too terrible. And then also uh, leaving uh, uh, a highly competitive population. In other words, you emigrate away and hopefully colonize a new habitat. So emigration away from the high population densities or your origin. Not too bad. This right here is the cattle egret. A lot easier to spell than Glanville fritillary. Uh, the cattle egret first arrived in South America in the 1800s. So you can see, um, I don't think they have 1800s, but they do have 1937. So in the 1800s, uh, the cattle egret arrived from Africa, right? This is an African bird. And then by 1943, their population dispersed further. And then you can just chart the years. As they disperse and disperse. So dispersal changes population dynamics. Uh, dispersal causes ed expansion in range. Uh, so Ta-da. All right. So we have the environment, like climactic shifts causing expansion or contraction in ranges. We have dispersal. Dispersal is an expansion mechanism. So... Uh, unless they all disperse out of their original range, um, dispersion is going to expand population ranges. Then uh, the last one that could cause population ranges to expand and contract are humans, because we suck. Uh, so... Um, <clears throat> we... Uh, we are causing global climate change uh, and destroying habitats, doing habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation, uh, and that sucks. So, for instance, uh, the morning dove does well in human uh, habitated areas. Morning dove adapted to cities. Let's just say, make it easier. So when humans expand, when cities expand, 
morning dove populations expand. Uh, expand. But when morning dove populations expand, oftentimes native competitors contract. Uh, this right here is the Yangtze River dolphin. It was on the Yang, it lived in the Yangtze River. Um, and it is extinct. Uh, basically, uh, the Yangtze River dof dolphin, like the, the Irrawaddy River dolphin, um, it, uh, it relies on periodic floods uh, to, you know, feed. Uh, so it needs periodic flooding. It relies on water movement. It relies on following its prey around. And the Yangtze River got overly dammed up. And the dolphin could not move. Vessel traffic increased. Fisheries wiped out their prey. Uh, and it went extinct. And it went extinct crushingly recently. Uh, the, the thing that tipped the scales was the Three Gorges Dam. Some gigantic, massive, uh, triple hydro, uh, hydroelectric dam project China did to show the world how awesome they are. And now it's leaking. And so they drove the Yangtze River Dolphin extinct uh, for a dam they didn't build right and will have to be destroyed at some point. Humanity! Okay, so um, populations fluctuate over time. That is just kind of a fact of population ecology. Um, and so predators often follow prey. And I don't mean like there's a moose, I'm going to follow it and hunt it and kill it. I mean, when you have a prey population that goes up, then as prey become more abundant, the predator population, oh, I didn't change color. The predator population will go up as well. Then at a certain point, the predator population spikes and there's, you know, more predators than the prey can handle. And the prey population starts to go down. And then there's not enough prey to go around. And the predator, per pop, the predator population goes down. Ta-da! So, um, predators follow prey. When the prey populations spike, predator populations will spike. And then that will cause prey populations to crash. And then predator populations will crash. Wolves in blue, moose in red. So uh, we have an increase in meese. Uh, and then that allows wolves to go up. Um, and then suddenly we have a decrease in meese and wolves crash. And then a slow increase in meese and wolf populations are on an average increase. So, sometimes we have uh, regular cycling of these predator-prey dynamics. So, uh, the snowshoe hare and the lynx are under a 10-year cycle. There are three hypotheses as to why hare populations are under the 10-year cycle and thus lynx populations as well. <clears throat> First off, food shortages in winter. If there's a food shortage in winter, then uh, the hare populations go down. That is a hypothesis. However, it suffers one problem as a potential explanation. Uh, and that's um, no evidence of uh, food availability on a 10-year cycle. If 
food availability is not on a 10 year cycle. So the regularity of this cycle <clears throat> would make sense. So two other potential hypotheses out there. One, hair goes up, links go up. Lynx eat hair. Hair go down. Lynx go down. And the time it takes to do this, just due to the natural reproductive cycles, ends up being a roughly 10 year cycle. So, do to reproduction etc it's on a 10 year cycle hypothesis 3 is kind of fun um, sunspot activity cycles every 11 years cycles over 11 years and this is a 10 year cycle that's pretty close so how could that work um, <clears throat> low activity equals uh, less ozone which equals more UV and then uh, which provokes a plant response. And weirdly enough, plant chemicals, so the chemicals that plants produce uh, against UV are nutritive. So that's better food. And so when sunspot cycles, when sunspot activity cycles down, you get a cascade effect that results in higher quality food. So um, <clears throat> hair populations go up with higher quality food. So there's really only two realistic options, sunspots and predator prey interactions. So let's look at the experiment that was produced in order to test this. Um, one. They took snowshoe hairs uh, and essentially uh, they, sorry, they did their experiment in the winter. So they first experiment in winter. Why would you experiment in winter? That's pretty easy. Uh, there's food shortages in winter. That means the experimenters can directly affect how much food and the quality of food the hares get. So, the experimenters can provide food. All right, they did several different groups, right? First, the snowshoe hares in the wild were provided unlimited food supplements. Um, and what happened was, uh, <clears throat> so this was all about whether or not food shortages on a 10 year cycle were causing this. So in winter during a food shortage uh, they gave hares a crap load of food and hare population went up so number one here tests number one here it's not on the food wasn't on a 10-year cycle but they tested it anyway and they found out that when you were on that crappy food availability 
uh, the hair population went up, but the lynx hair cycle was unbroken. So, predator-prey interactions. Sorry, I am so tired. It is 5.42 in the morning. I am, like, blitzing out, but I will continue. I soldier on. I'm, like... Nine slides left. I can do this. I can do this fast. Okay, so for number two, we're testing hair population go up, lynx population go up, lynx eat hair, hair go down, lynx go down, right? So they put snowshoe hares in exclosures with and without extra food, and then they radio collared the hares. So first off, um, the exclusures had no links in them. When you give the hares unlimited food and no lynxes, the cycle is broken. So unlimited food plus no predators equals 10-year cycle broken. The 10-year cycle was hairs go up, hairs go down, and links go up, links go down. Right? So here, the X closure had no links and it had a ton of food, so hairs went up. <clears throat> And they didn't come back down in a regular cycle. Right? When they limited their food availability, the cycle continued. Uh, but that's likely just due to starvation more than anything else. Um... And then they also radio collared hairs. So they went ahead and radio collared hairs so they could find out what was killing them every 10 years. And they found 90% of deaths were due to predators. So 90% of their radio collared hairs were killed by lynx predators. So, if you exclude predators but don't give them food, then there's too many rabbits that eat all their food and die. So, no predators limit food. Uh... Population goes up, they starve, the population goes down. Who could have thunk it? Right? If you add a whole bunch of food and there are still predators, then give food. Hair population went up. Then lynx population went up. Then hair population went down. Right? Uh, and so in this case, um, predation was the cycle generator rather than starvation. And they confirmed that by seeing that 90% of their radio collared hairs were marked by predators. So... Um, number three, sunspots versus snowshoe hair populations was literally correlation. So, there you got it. There you got it. Um, 
if you give a bunch of snowshoe hares in the wild food, then their population goes up, but then it crashes on that 10 year cycle. So it's not that they're food limited. It's not the limitation of food causing the 10 year crash. Number three was correlational and there wasn't a good way to actually study it. Like nutrient de uh, density varies no matter what, it's completely variable. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a correlational thing with no real direct evidence behind it. But number two has a bunch of good direct evidence. When you keep links out and you give them a bunch of food, their population just goes up and doesn't crash. Uh, when you give them a bunch of food, but you allow lynx to be present, their population goes up and then it crashes. And then the lynx population crash. Uh, almost like there's not enough food to go around. Um, and then when they, you know, allowed lynx in and just didn't give them food, then the rabbits starved to death. And, uh, yeah. Uh, there you go. That is the population cycle, the 10 year population cycle with lynx and hares. Okay, population growth capacity. So now let's talk about how populations grow to fit their environment. <clears throat> I know I can finish this thing. First off, Exponential growth describes growth of populations when there's no limits. So if a population is undergoing exponential growth, you can be sure at the moment there is nothing limiting that population's growth. Now, every given environment has what's called a carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals a given area can handle. In other words, when you hit carrying capacity, anything that goes beyond that gonna die. Gosh darn it, didn't change the color. Huh. So this is my carrying capacity. It's often abbreviated K. So, without the limits of the carrying capacity, population undergoes exponential growth. The exponential growth phase. But as we get closer to carrying capacity, there's fewer resources to go around. And so growth slows down and you get this curve. And that curve is the logistic growth phase. Right? So, basically population growth goes down because there's more competition. because you're nearing the carrying capacity. So, not too bad. So in general, we expect to see populations follow this basic growth trend where they have early exponential growth, then as they approach the carrying capacity, they go into a logistical phase, and then they hit carrying capacity, and they net stay at it. These are, this is a basic population growth model. 
Uh, here's um, <clears throat> exponential. Woo. Uh, and then here is your logistical. And then here is your carrying capacity. So not too bad. As populations approach carrying capacity, competition goes up and population size increase, like the growth, the population growth slows down. Hence why you get that little S curve. So examples of logistical growth. Fur seals. Um, on St. Paul Island, fur seals show a standard logistical population growth curve. Um, and then water fleas also show this growth curve. And we can hype it. Well, yellow is not very good. But the water fleas were done in a lab. And so this imaginary line here is the carrying capacity. And you can see water fleas, they kind of lay a crap load of eggs. So their population went up above the carrying capacity and then crashed and then kind of stuck around at the carrying capacity. So there you go. Uh, so when we talk about where they are on the curve uh, and uh, how their population growth relates to where they are on the curve. Uh, basically, we can say there are K selected species that do very good jobs of re uh, reproducing relatively slow. So uh, they reproduce slowly they produce few large, well cared for offspring. Um, basically really great for maintaining a population at the carrying capacity without violating it. Uh, our selected populations are like these water fleas. They crank out tons of offspring. So, K selected. Species tend to produce relatively few large offspring. Right. Generally, we have uh, large amounts of parental care. So um, there you go. Uh, whooping cranes here. Um, they don't mature till four. four years old and their lifespan exceeds 30 which is pretty darn good for a large bird right um, so they have a lot of time to invest in reproducing and they pay a lot of attention to their offspring um, whales so this is uh, a whooping crane. Whales are very case selected. Uh, they rarely have twins. Most of the time they just have a single calf. And depending on the species, that calf may be, uh, you know, like... Uh, I think there's some species of whale that like sexually mature at 12 years old or more, like 10 or more years old. So, and then of course humans, right? Uh, so are selected, they reproduce many small offspring. So our selected are playing a numbers game. Uh, so you're gonna have high mortality in our selected organisms, very few are going to live to adulthood. So high mortality, 
uh, tons of offspring. Low parental care. Generally, no parental care. Uh, aphids, which are often born pregnant. Uh, mice. Cockroaches. Many insects are, are selected. And again, they're playing an, uh, a population survival numbers game. If you can produce... 500 offspring, then chances are two or three of them are going to live and reproduce. K-selected are investing in their offspring to make sure that they survive and reproduce as best they can, and they're having very few. They're not playing a numbers game. They're raising their own damn baby. Okay, so basic R-selected and K-selected features. Ah. Right, uh, age at first reproduction and R selected early, K selected late. Lifespan in R selected tends to be short, K selected tends to be long. Maturation time short, long. Mortality rate uh, it's a numbers game, so a ton of them are expected to die. Uh, <coughs> K selected, they're doing their best to keep them alive. Number of offspring produced per reproductive episode. Tons in the R selected, few in the K selected. Number of uh, reproductions per lifetime. <coughs> this one's interesting. Often multiple uh, offspring over the years. Whereas many R selected ones, uh, they pour all their energy into reproducing. And then they die. They have a giant sex party and die. Uh, a lot of cephalopods do that. Parental care. Uh, almost none in R selected. Like if there's any, it's an outlier. Then often extensive in K selected. Finally, size of offspring. Uh or the eggs. In general, in R selected, you're going to have teeny tiny little babies because you got to crank 500 out of that genital tract, man. Whether it's eggs or offspring, man. So, you know, there you go. So close, man. 22 of 25. <sighs> Life histories. Uh, when it comes to reproduction are normally a trade-off between reproduction and survival, right? So basically, uh, caring for young is energetically costly. It costs energy, right? And so devoting energy to young means less energy for survival. So we have a trade-off here. Putting more energy into your young will do a better job allowing them to survive in the uncaring universe. Uh, but it will also mean the parent is uh, has got less energy to go around. Um, so, um, parents who invest parental care in a lot of young uh, could end up uh, more likely to die during the winter because they don't, uh, they spend all their energy protecting their young and raising their young and don't feed themselves enough. So, um, here we have parents surviving the winter uh, when you have a reduced brood size. Um, both parents are highly likely to survive the winter after reproduction. 
If they have a normal brood size, the parents are less likely to survive the next winter in this. I think this is a kite species. Uh, and then when you have an enlarged uh, brood size, um, you have significant less likelihood of surviving. So, if food is not all that great, like, you may get eating some of your young to bring those numbers up for surviving the next winter, man. 23. Human population growth. Humans are K-selected, right? Just naturally, we are K-selected. Uh, in the past, right, A, one baby per year on average. Some people can pull two if the timing's right. Uh, and then there's always twins and triplets and stuff. But low number of babies, low number of babies per year. No one's squatting and dropping 600 eggs in an Oothika. And then we have tons of parental care. Hypothetically. Hopefully I didn't bring up some past trauma. Uh, so these are absolutely K-selected features. In addition, uh, humans have remained K-selected because of food availability. We couldn't afford to feed huge populations of humans. So in the past, there was low food availability. Um, then there was lots of disease. That was just a fact of life. Right? Uh, and then really far back, you had predators. Get at by dire wolf. So, we remained K-selected because of that low fit food availability, that a uh, large amount of disease uh, naturally causing us to stay K-selected because if we suddenly had a ton of babies, there'd be more disease, that sort of thing. Uh, and then also that you get far enough back and human populations were limited by predators as well. So, uh, food disease, predators. Now, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, technology has allowed us to stay in a <clears throat> uh, an exponential growth phase. So we are in exponential growth due to modern medicine, due to antiseptics, antibiotics, that sort of stuff. Um, humanity has been sustaining an exponential growth phase for much longer than it ever could have pre-society. <laughs> Bringing us to our final slide. Uh, I'm just going to tell you right here, this actually has turned out to not be true. So this is uh, coming from this uh, Malthusian economist. And he said the pores will eat us all out of house and home. And the pores will take all the resources because the pores are having all them babies. So Thomas Malthus uh, was this economist who was like, them pores suck. And so, you know, what would help is if the rich people didn't give any money to the pores, because then they wouldn't have the money to support all those families. 
And they were like, if the rich use charity to give money to the poor, then the poor will be dependent on the rich and will start a cycle of dependency. Um, and as it turned out, the idea that human population growth is going to destroy Earth by eating the, uh, the Earth's resources, gobbling them all up, has turned out to be largely false. Um, the population has continued to grow and uh, our emissions have reached like, have continued to decrease in their growth. I think like last year or this year, the U.S. actually hit like the lowest level of increase in CO2 emissions. It's like a sad milestone, but there you go. So I'm just going to just going to dispute this entire slide. We are not Malthusian economists here. And uh, it seems like any time the human population starts to get so big that we might violate the carrying capacity, we just kind of find new ways to increase the carrying capacity. And we haven't destroyed the world yet doing just that specifically. So, well, Malthus seems to have taken an L on this one. And so has this slide. Mm -hmm.